my treasured memories is one that, well, it's just a little tiny flicker. It's fleeting. It's really just the fragment of a memory. And I was reminded of it this week when I was gathering with, with some of the musicians and singers who are helping us next Sunday with hops and hymns at Untapped Territory. Now, it's just a little tiny piece of a memory, but I can really picture it clearly. I remember, um, I don't know exactly how old I was, probably maybe 12 or 13, and I was riding in the car with my mom, and she was driving me somewhere, maybe to a, a ball game or to a piano lesson or maybe just home from school. And I'm not sure she asked me to sing or I just felt like singing. It could have been a hymn. It could have been something that I had been hearing on the radio. But I just sang because it made me happy. And what I remember is looking at my mom and seeing this look of pure joy on her face. And I think it was the first time I might have realized that she was proud of me and she was proud of my singing and she was just happy that I was her daughter. I remember, um, it might have been a favorite hymn, but all I remember is that I was happy too. So this week, um, on Friday, I got together with my Lutheran, Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Baptist friends to practice for hops and hymns. And singing with them, I guess that's what reminded me because I felt that same joy. You know, my mom was not physically there with me, but I briefly flashed back to remembering that car ride with her and just the joy of singing. And it reminded me as I read the lectionary scriptures for today, it, this reflects uh, today uh, in the church calendar is Transfiguration Sunday. And I was searching in my mind when I was reading the lectionary scriptures for some, you know, some big mountaintop experience that I could share with you all. Uh, maybe somewhere I'd been on top of a mountain, literally, or at a beach or some other beautiful place of natural beauty. And then I thought about singing with my mom in the car that day. And I think maybe that was a holy moment, too. So what are we to make of the transfiguration of Jesus? Well, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew for an account of that particular mountaintop experience. From Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw, saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. I know I'm not the only one who has felt this way. Because I've heard other people talk about this too. I really would like to have this kind of mountaintop experience where I hear God speak to me in an audible voice. You know, in fact, I'm just a little jealous sometimes when I hear people tell glorious stories about their version of mountaintop experiences. Now, I've had some what I would call holy encounters in places where it's just beautiful or in worship, but it doesn't happen every week. It doesn't even happen, well, even every year. Sometimes this makes me think that I have failed spirituality 101. I have the same kind of spiritual jealousy when I hear someone's rock bottom story and how their life was turned around and transformed by divine intervention. That's not my story either. For me, the truth of the matter is that even as an ordained clergy person, as a pastor, my spiritual life looks 
well, it looks pretty ordinary, maybe even mundane. Now, Peter, he denied knowing Jesus when the going got tough, if you'll remember. And he had this glorious experience firsthand. Looks like God could cut me some slack and give me a, just a little bit of this. When I really think about it, though, I realize that part of my problem, part of my problem with craving holy, transformative experiences is that if I focus just on that, I'll miss the holy, everyday experiences. If I fail to see God in a bit of dew on a spider web, well, perhaps my problem is not with God, but perhaps the problem is me. It occurs to me that, well, I have a tendency to kind of put my life in neat little boxes. You know, there's church and spirituality, and there's everyday things. I'm just as guilty as anyone of maybe I've left a worship service where I was just a participant and listening, and I probably have complained that I, I got nothing from it. I've heard people say that when they've left churches before, that uh, they say they left the church, this church or that church, because they were not being fed. Well, here's the problem with that kind of thinking. You know, we might actually miss seeing God in action if we only look for these high, holy experiences, and we fail to see God when we're doing the ordinary things of life, getting our prescriptions filled, or filling our car up with gas, or maybe just sorting socks. In today's gospel, Peter responds, probably like I would have had I been there, Lord, it's good to be here. Let's set up shop and stay on this mountaintop. Well, I suppose it is good to witness what Peter did, to see, to hear, and to have this forever memory of Jesus, seeing him changed. You know, in the message translation that says that he was changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. And of course, when the cloud covered them and they heard the voice of God, they were so awestruck that they just fell to the ground. I'd probably do that too, had I been there. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think that experiencing breathtaking beauty and inspiring worship, maybe some time and place where you really have set aside for some deep contemplation, all of these are really good things. No doubt for Peter and company, seeing their teacher, their rabbi, he was their traveling buddy, and to see him transfigured, change like this, it must have been a startling revelation for them. You know, I bet they thought they knew Jesus, and they knew Jesus the man, but they didn't really know Jesus, the divine one, the beloved son of God. We may get too comfortable, too, with the Jesus that we think that we know, the Sunday school Jesus, the what a friend we have in Jesus, the sweetest name I know, Jesus. If we think we have God all figured out, well, we may be in trouble. We cannot contain God in a theological, cultural, or political box just because it's easy, it's comfortable, it's safe. Mountaintop moments can light a stick of dynamite to those predictable boxes. And that's a good thing. Reminders that God's ways are not our ways. Well, that's healthy for us to grow in our faith. So here at the end of the season of Epiphany, we come to Transfiguration Sunday, and we see Jesus, I hope, in a new way. Next week, we're going to enter the season of Lent, and that's a season of soul-searching and contemplation. Transfiguration Sunday reminds us that the babe in the manger, the preacher on the mountain describing who is blessed, the teacher, the friend, well, is also God. And it should bring us to our knees. But like Peter, James, and John, we can't stay there. 
if we stay on the mountaintop in that holy moment, well, it means that we're not moving. Most of life doesn't happen in burst of light and sudden glory. But all of life, every rugged bit of it, every shred of it is holy. The bigger challenge for the Christian is not seeking out glorious epiphanies in high places, but in seeing God in the valley, seeing God in the dirty face of a child, in the kindness of a stranger, in the mess and muck of everyday life. You know, before Peter can get, it's good to be here out of his mouth, and he tries to hold on to it. We can't hoard God or God moments. We cannot contain God, even in beautiful containers. God says that to us in no uncertain terms. And quickly, Peter and his companions are covered in a bright cloud, a thick cloud, and God says to them, stop talking and start listening. Listen to Jesus. Listen to what Jesus tells you about the way of discipleship. It is the way of suffering, humility, sacrifice. Listen when Jesus tells you about the cross and then follow. After this moment of awe and fear, the silenced disciples are still on the ground afraid. What does Jesus do? Jesus came and touched them saying, get up and do not be afraid. And just like that, an ordinary human action of comfort, he touches his friends. This is still Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus, their friend and companion. We are not made for unending mountaintop experiences. Too much of the spectacular and we would likely lose our footing on the spiritual journey of our lives. Do I, do you, do we, do we still long for the holy sacred moments that dazzle us, that surprise us? Well, of course we do. But we need to follow Jesus even when it leads us through the valley far away from the lofty holy moments that we tuck away to remember. Perhaps that is why that in the ordinary moments hidden in my consciousness, that ordinary moment with my mom was triggered when I sang with my friends. Maybe that has more power, that kind of memory to nurture, to feed our souls, to feed every high holy moment that we've ever experienced. Jesus says to you and to me, do not be afraid. Put one foot in front of the other and follow me. Study, pray, worship, serve your neighbors. That is the path of righteousness. And you know, if by chance we get a glimpse of glory, may we say amen and thank you and what's next, Lord? What's next? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.